let's let's try that again good evening everyone and welcome to another session of the beyond access series uh, thank you all for joining. My name is Jose and I'll be your host this evening. Uh, we're really excited to be back with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation to wrap up our session uh, on inclusion and disability awareness. Um, but before we get in there, just a couple of housekeeping announcements as always. Uh, the session is being recorded and it's gonna be posted on our YouTube page. Uh, if you don't follow us, well, what are you doing? Please follow us so that you have access to all of our other amazing special education content. And that's so you can stay in the loop uh, to uh, anything that happens for Beyond Access. Um, I'm gonna start speaking a little slower for our interpreters now because I forget sometimes. Um, like we do every night, the, there will be no chat function during the session, but the Q&A function will be on for you to ask questions throughout the presentation. And we can answer questions during the session as best we can but we also set time aside at the end to answer questions uh, at the time at that time as well. Uh, tonight is the fifth and final part of our series, uh, Disability Inclusion Matters, Cultivating Welcoming Communities. Uh, this final of five webinars uh, will share key principles that cultivate a welcoming school community uh, and talking about both accessibility and inclusion. Uh, it discusses the benefits of inclusion, cl inclusive classrooms for, dis uh, for students with disabilities and reviews four types of barriers, physical, institutional, informational, and attitudinal. That's a mouthful. Uh, to explain it better than I could, I'm so happy to welcome back Rachel and Ashley with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. And of course, our ASL interpreter, Greeny and Debbie in the background. Good evening, ladies. Thank you, Jose. Very excited to be here. Um, and yeah, I will just bring up our screen. So take it away, Ashley. Hey everybody, it's so great to be here with you all this evening. Uh, my name is Ashley harris Whaley, and I'm the Project Manager for Engagement and Communities at CPF. I am a white woman. I have long curly brown hair. I'm wearing a dark shirt and I'm sitting in my office. And we are here this evening to talk to y'all about inclusion as it relates to communities and how we can make them as welcoming as possible. So throughout this webinar, you'll hear us intentionally varying our language between person first language and identity first language. And that's done intentionally to respect the differing preferences of the disability community. So we're gonna start out with this fabulous quote from Alice Wong, which really speaks to the power of inclusion and the power of um, how we can have meaningful conversations about inclusion. We've opened with introductions to folks in the disability community in other webinars, and we're going to continue that this evening. But I think the point of this quote that's so powerful is that while conversations are important, they really are the beginning of the process, right? Action and tangible change are really the only ways that we can make our communities and our environments truly welcoming. So what does it mean for something to be accessible? Simply, it's a community that's equally available to all, but beyond that, to be accessible means that a community actually desires the participation and the presence of all. So we've talked about how the disability community is the largest and the most diverse minority group in the US and in the world. So as you might imagine, our access needs are as varied and diverse as we are. So truly welcoming environments consider and support disabilities that are temporary or permanent, um, visible and or invisible, or congenital or acquired. 
All of these are different types of disabilities and folks can have overlapping disabilities that go between those categories. So needing to be inclusive for all is super important. And welcoming communities also support and are receptive to people with all kinds of disabilities. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but physical, cognitive, mental health, and sensory disabilities are all very common types. And there can also be overlaps within these types within even a single individual. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. Well, thank you, Ashley. So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Rachel Byrne and I'm the Executive Director at the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. I'm a white woman with long brown hair, wearing a white shirt and a denim uh, jacket. So if we're thinking about what is inclusion, um, inclusion goes beyond a seat at the table. True inclusion is an invitation to participate um, and to have that participation be valued and respected. And I think it's so important when we think about that. So a lot of the times we'll say, you know, someone, you know, should have a seat at the table, but that seat isn't enough anymore. We really need to make sure that we are offering the ability for everybody to have input and for everybody to be heard um, and to also lead conversations. I think that's a very big part of this, this conversation. So... What a welcoming community is not. And, you know, some of these are pretty self-explanatory. So welcoming communities environments do not exclude either intentionally or unintentionally. And I just want to preface a lot of that. So a lot of the times when we're thinking about our communities and our school environments and anywhere else, you know, a lot of the things that happen aren't intentional. They are unintentional. However, we are in the the stage of uh, disability inclusion and understanding that sometimes being naive and even those things can be unintentional, you know, it's still not good enough anymore. And I think we can all actually move forward into thinking what's next. So often exclusion of disabled people doesn't begin intentionally. So I'm getting a little uh, person coming to join us. So I'm really sorry, everybody, but my five-year-old wants me to draw koalas. Obviously you can hear I've got an Australian accent but um, she'll get to come in and, and join us in a little bit later. But so when we're thinking about, um, you know, exclusion of disabled people, it doesn't begin intentionally. It just isn't considered. And, and I think it's a really important piece for us to think about when we're having conversations and we're trying to, you know, we've spoken a lot about um, calling someone in and calling someone out. It's, it's really important that we sort of preface that to begin with. But we also need to make sure that we don't need to be patronised to people with disabilities or make them feel as if they are being included as a courtesy or a favour. You know, this, this whole piece, we want to be really active, true, authentic representation. The other piece um, that we want to think about is any community or environment that is inaccept inaccessible, um, be that be physically or attitudinally, is not welcoming to all. False allyship is also something that we need to talk about today because it does not come from a genuine place and it isn't indicative of a welcoming community. So what do we mean by false allyship? So sometimes people will claim to be allies of the disability community and then not necessarily show that with their actions or they may potentially do one thing and actually their actions show something very, very different. So you know, when we're talking about allyship, we understand that it's a lifelong learning experience and all of us have an opportunity to continue to be wonderful allies um, to obviously our students and the disability community, but it doesn't come from a one single effort. It is definitely a lifelong component. And I think the other thing is to remember is that we can't view accessibility as an option or an afterthought. It really should just be part of how everything is. And so how do we make that happen? Well, I think one of the big questions we need to ask ourselves is who is the world designed and built for? And, you know, the world is designed and built for people without disabilities the majority of the time. And disabled people, rarely their access considerations aren't considered. And sometimes we might go, oh, okay, well, a ramp was added. But where was that ramp added? Was it added at the back of um, a building? Was it actually a different entrance altogether? Was the experience that somebody has while traveling through a particular environment very different because obviously maybe stairs were a big feature that was put in or, or something like that. And obviously that's just sort of the physical world. So accessibility is not integrated into default design principles. And 
something to really for a lot of people to look into if a concept that's really worked within the architecture world is universal design and universal design is good for everybody and, and something that isn't an add-on it's something that is built in from the very beginning so our next um, piece that we're going to actually person we're going to introduce you to is Zach Anna and and Zach Anna is a wonderful ambassador of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation but he's also a comedian and author a YouTuber and this is a great quote from him so you want the world to be set up for you, but sometimes it just isn't. And I think all of us need to have a little reflection on that. And then when we're thinking about our school environments, what does that look like? But, um, you know, because we're all here and I think the majority of us are based in New York City, we're actually going to show you a film that we did with Zach and it's called Zach Anna and the Quest for the Rainbow Bagel. Now this actually went viral and it's been now seen, I think, by close to 100 million people worldwide. But one of the biggest things to understand with this, this was not scripted. This was purely an experience of what it was like to move throughout New York City. So with that, um, please enjoy. Uh, how's it going? Today we're just like, we'll do something real simple, like go and get a bagel. We've been waiting to go downstairs for about 25 minutes now. All of the elevators that have come by have been full. Well, there's other elevators in this hotel, but we can't get to them because there's stairs to the elevator. Hi! Uh, I think maybe we should improvise, guys. Here we go. Can we make it in this one? Hi. Okay, it only took an hour to get from my room to downstairs. How can I help you today? This film crew wants to send me on a solo New York adventure to get New York bagels. You can get bagels anywhere. I know. They've come up with the idea that it's best to go to Brooklyn to, oh, to, Brooklyn. A, to a place. Bagels? Yeah. They want the rainbow bagel oh, in Brooklyn. The rainbow bagel. Wow, that looks pretty though. That is a pretty bagel, I must say. <laughs> Take the East Subway okay. right to Metropolitan Avenue. And they got good bagels there, my man. Look at All that. Right. All right. Rainbow bagels. I'll baby. let you know how it is and if oh, it's it worth the Hey, could you bring me one back? I will bring you one back. Thanks, yes, buddy. I will. I how long that. are you working, Judge? I'll be here until three. Well, You're gonna be back before I leave? Well, I can try. We have less than five hours to go get a bagel, so let's go catch a train. Bagel crust! Bagel crust! I thought she'd be bigger, honestly, but I'm glad I saw it while I was here. Oh, I think I found it, and I scared a baby. It says Subway. There's stairs. Oh, you got a map? Awesome. Perhaps it might be across the street. Oh, thank you so, so much. Okay, just hit it with some speed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, I, I get it! New York! The city that never stops f***ing with you. What? There's f***ing more steps! If I don't find this entrance, I'm giving up on life and bagels. I see an M! There's a little wheelchair underneath the M! ta -da! An elevator. So let's go. We're taking the A train. Da -da 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 -da. No one else is as excited. What are we gonna do? We have to take a boat. A boat? There's no accessible train. We have to take the Bagel Ferry. All in all, a pretty fun, efficient day. Bagel! I'm going 
going to just assume that nothing will go wrong and we'll happily get our gaggle of bagels. <laughs> Whoa! There's a man named Judd waiting for me in Manhattan. So it's 1.15. We've got exactly one hour and 45 minutes to go and get Judd's bagel and coffee. And if we don't get it, then he's going to be starving back at the hotel. So we've got to find out where this place is. Do you know where Rainbow Bagel is? Oh, no. Do you know where Rainbow Bagel is, sir? Do you know where Rainbow Bagel is? <laughs> what the? Look at how hip that guy is. I, I love fair trade coffee. Isn't Whole Foods the greatest? Do you know where Rainbow Bagel is? What? Brooklyn has not accepted me, and this is my best outfit. Bunch of ableist hipsters, I think. That's a nice hat, though, sir. <laughs> bagel store, the world's best bagels. That must be the one. 754 Metropolitan. When you go that way, you make a left. Those bagels are gonna taste so good. What the f It's not accessible. Let's go home. Hey, good afternoon, boss. How you Hello. doing? Hello. How you doing? I'm doing all right. I can help you today. I need a rainbow bagel. Anything else? Um. No, just the ramp. New York City is actually one of the most accessible cities in the country, and they still have a long way to go. So in order to make sure that happens, you gotta donate to places like the Cerebral Palsy Foundation and keep having the important conversations to make sure people like me can get access to whatever color bagels they want. I may have struggled getting this bagel today, but I didn't get this for me. I got this for my friend Judd. And friendship is what's really important. Oh, sh! I just took a bite of Judd's bagel. Ah, I barely, barely knew the guy. Who cares? No, I think when you sort of look at that video, well, obviously, Zach brings so much comedy and lightheartedness to that, the fact that it really takes about five hours to get from um, the Upper East Side to, to Brooklyn in you know, a power wheelchair or any wheelchair for that matter is something that really does need improving within New York City and, and something when we're thinking about you know, how welcoming is the city to those um, who need mobility devices and those with disabilities. So you know, when we're thinking about, well, what a welcoming community is, what, what could we have done differently? What, what could the city look like differently? Well, it would be inclusive. It would be supportive. It would be accessible. and would be full of genuine allyship. It would be full of people willing to help. It would be full of those people that don't ignore somebody on the street. It would be full of, you know, people who want to make a difference. Sorry guys, I forgot I muted myself during the video. But what are the benefits of a welcoming and inclusive classroom community? So we're about to take a little deep dive into that. So the first benefit is that an inclusive classroom community tailors teaching to all learners. We all know that every student, um, irrespective of disability, is going to learn differently from one another, right? And in an inclusive classroom, teachers weave in tailored instruction and support that can help students make progress. These strategies are helpful for all students. Um, an example of this is the Universal Design for Instruction that offers a flexible framework for all students. Another benefit is that inclusive classrooms embrace diversity and disability. Inclusive classrooms are filled with diverse learners, each of whom has their own strengths and their own challenges. 
And inclusion gives students a way to talk about, not just talk about, but experience how everyone learns in their own way and everyone benefits from that fact and from the diversity of learning styles in their classroom. And the third benefit of an inclusive classroom is that it supports social emotional learning. And an inclusive classroom can bring specialists into the classroom to help advise and help create a more accessible community. These specialists um, aren't limited to, of course, but school counselors, um, speech language pathologists, of which I am one, just as a fun side note, uh, reading specialists, um, and other support providers. All of these are so integral to developing social emotional learning, which is really at the heart of disability inclusion. And the fourth benefit of inclusive classrooms is that they create appropriate expectations for all. It, they allow us to presume competence, which should be our default, and to assign our expectations appropriately. Differentiated instruction and co-teaching in a general education classroom makes it easier for students with IEPs and 504s to be taught at the same grade level and the same content material as their classmates that are within their same learning community. And as far as assigning expectations, um, disabled people and disabled students sort of generally tend to fall into the unfortunate trap of expectations that are assigned either being too low or too high, largely on the basis of the disability alone. So if we're assigning appropriate expectations, we're not allowing just the student's disability to be the driver of assigning the expectation. It's more a knowledge of the student and their learning style and their learning needs. So what are some barriers to access and inclusion? We know they're plentiful. We are going to hit some of the high spots. So physical barriers, per the CDC, these exist when there are structural objects or barriers in our natural communities that block people from being able to move about in their environments. And when we're thinking about accessibility and barriers to accessibility, it's probably easiest um, for us to think about these physical, tangible, visible access needs. And some examples of ways that barriers can translate to accessibility, which we're going to touch on again later, is just having the need met so that places can be accessed by folks with mobility aids, um, curb cuts, that's easy, elevators, ramps. And then though it's less tangible, uh, we're, we live very much in the digital world now, and that's also a consideration that we should be making, which we're going to come back around to. So our next category is institutional barriers. And these are present when a policy or a procedure or a rule is established by an organization and that puts folks with disabilities at a disadvantage. Institutional barriers are incredibly systemic. Um, we've mentioned in, in other webinars of this series how ableism shows up in almost every system of our society and in institutional barriers are probably the most perfect example of that. Consequences of institutional barriers are unfulfilling and possibly discriminatory school experiences. A perfect seemingly harmless example of this is attendance policies. Um, students with disabilities are disproportionately negatively affected by attendance policies, and you can probably imagine why. Um, and then later in life, things like uh, barriers to employment and higher unemployment rates among folks who are disabled. And our next category is informational barriers. So 
These occur when information is not presented in an accessible way, in a way that's accessible to everyone. Um, accessible information accommodates all of our different communication modalities, including things like Braille and ASL and augmentative alternative communication, um, plain language and things that are sensory friendly. This is where that digital world conversation kind of comes back around. It's physical, yet it's also informational because any information when it's presented, be that verbally or written or visually or whatever, should always consider different communication modalities and the way the different ways that folks with disabilities um, consume and communicate information. And then our next category is probably the most pervasive um, from my experience as a disabled person anyway. These are attitudinal barriers. So these happen when prejudices, attitudes, biases, stigma, all of these things hold back everyone's participation. Um, again, my perspective, but, but probably the perspective of a lot of other disabled people is that attitudinal barriers are often the hardest to surmount really. And the enduring stigma that surrounds disability and surrounds disabled people, it still persists um, despite all the gains that we have made towards disability inclusion. So th thinking of attitudinal barriers, a big one, which we've, uh, you know, touched on in previous series, but we thought it worthy of bringing back around is ableism. So ableism is probably the most widespread attitudinal barrier that's faced by people with disabilities. It shows up literally everywhere in our society in all of the ways that we've just talked about through physical, informational, institutional barriers. It's there in all of that. And a consequence of ableism, which is really unfortunate, is internalized ableism. And internalized ableism, <coughs> sorry guys, internalized ableism, like I said, it's a direct consequence of ableism and of all of these barriers that are everywhere. So what internalized ableism is, is when people with disabilities start to believe prejudices and negative falsehoods about themselves, think things like um, you're a burden, uh, you're a drain on resources, you ask for too much, you're too much trouble. All of these like negative mentalities become ingrained in a person because they're reinforced day in and day out by our society, be that directly or indirectly. And as far as these barriers, you know, we've, we've talked about each kind and what they are and how they show up, but what are their consequences? Like what happens because of these barriers? And because of the bias and the stigma that continues to color how our society views disability, the disability community, the, the, the fact that we are like subjected to access barriers of whatever kind they may be, it's literally continuous. And naturally these barriers all have very negative consequences. Um, they damage our self-worth. We kind of talked about that just a second ago with internalized ableism. They reinforce the incorrect notion that ableism is acceptable, compromises our education opportunities, our employment opportunities. It reinforces our lack of representation and kind of status as like invisibles in society, and it minimizes our access everywhere. And honestly, y'all, one of our most powerful tools for combating these barriers, combating ableism, combating uh, internalized ableism is accurate disability representation. And we've introduced y'all to a lot of folks throughout all of these um, series, and we've really enjoyed that. And we're going to continue to do that just as we introduced you to Zach a few slides ago. We'll turn it back over to Rachel.
So in saying that, um, Jenny Lay Flurry, who is the Chief Accessibility Officer at Microsoft, um, is probably one of my favourite human beings. <laughs> like the, the work that she is doing is extraordinary and the what she has done both for Microsoft as a company, but also thinking what she has done within the tech space um, and beyond really thinking about accessibility in general is, you know, it's really amazing and she's a trailblazer. But this quote is one of my favourites. So accessibility is the route to innovation and to inclusion. Without it, you exclude. It's honestly that simple. So everyone asks, well, you know, you're telling us about these barriers. You're telling us about all these different things. Like, what can we do about it? Well, accessibility is part of this answer. And, you know, if you want to be inclusive, think about that as sort of one of your the main pieces. And, um, you know, her... Her standard of how large scales corporation environments can prioritize inclusion and access um, is transforming itself into a welcoming community. And, and as I said, she is really, the work that she is doing is phenomenal. And this is a little bit more um, from Jenny. I think accessibility is just a way to empower inclusion, right? You, there are over a billion people in the world, over 70% of disabilities invisible. You may never know that you have an employee on your team in your company that has a disability. Um, and if we can really inclusively build these features into our products and use the expertise of people with disabilities, one, we're gonna get better products, we're gonna innovate in a crazy way, and more importantly, we, in some ways, you're gonna really build inclusion just into the fabric. Um, easy for someone who needs captioning to just switch on captioning. Easy for someone who needs a screen reader to just switch it on. Um, no barriers, uh, which I think just gives us a different playing field. That's, that's my hope. I, I would love for us through the work to be able to change an unemployment rate that hasn't materially shifted in 30 years. What do I say to people who say this is a cost? So I try and keep a straight face, first of all, because it's, that's clearly poppycock. Um, it's not, that's not true at all. I, this is an investment. This is something that you need to do to ensure that your product works for everyone who's going to use your product, whether it's a website, a document, a, a, a SharePoint, whatever it may be. There's no way that any one of us would want to feel that we are excluding a segment of the population from using something you produce. And if you don't invest in accessibility, that's what you're going to do. Um, so it, it really is a get it done um, from my perspective. And uh, I more question the fact that why it hasn't been included at the beginning of the design cycle. And then it's not part of a cost. It's not part of something uh, that crops up in that way. It becomes part of building a better product. You know, so I think Jenny really sort of emphasizes the point there that inclusion and accessibility shouldn't be an afterthought and it should be in integrated into any process from the start. And, and that doesn't just have to be talking about a product. That can be talking about a program. That can be talking about, you know, a, a, a different school project or something like that that you're doing. You know, if it's actually thought of from the very beginning and put in, it's a lot easier actually to facilitate. Um, and, you know, it'll benefit anyone in the long run. And I think she also speaks to how a conscious posture of inclusion and the emphasis on universal and accessible design has changed their culture, you know, and, and we can see just how tangible that change can be and it can be measured and all those different things that we know, for example, in schools, they, they want to be able to measure that change. You can. And I think this is the amazing thing. Like none of this of what we're saying is something that can't be measured, that can't show change um, and that can't show, you know, just the how much of impact it's having on students with disabilities and, and without. So... How do we move towards truly accessible environments and communities despite all the barriers that we've just discussed? Well, a few examples that we have here are curb cuts. You know, curb cuts, um, for any of you who need them, whether it be because uh, you're using a wheelchair or a mobility aid, whether it be because you have a child who's using a stroller, um, you know, they are really 
vital to accessibility when we're thinking about, you know, navigating the streets, whether it be in New York or any other city. Clear emergency routes are another one. You know, making sure things aren't in the way of emergency routes. And um, when I was, my background is as a physical therapist and a story that I will tell is I was at a school um, and they had put the, they were storing all this equipment in the emergency route for people. And they were like, well, but we, we use the stairs. And I'm like, well, you don't use the stairs if you're in a wheelchair. But they had just stored all this equipment there thinking, well, no one needs to use it. And what's that saying to that student is that you don't matter. You know, that we are using this as a storeroom over what will be your emergency exit route. Um, information posted at eye level. These are all really things that we can all do. This isn't costly. Um, Playground equipment that's usable by all. Um, thinking about how playgrounds are set up. Accessible bathrooms. And again, making sure those accessible bathrooms are actually usable for all, not using them as storerooms. We see that a lot within schools. Um, quiet rooms for people with sensory challenges. You know, physical accessibility is for everyone, regardless if their disability is visible or non-visible. And it's um, something that we all benefit from and something that we need to make sure is a priority both within the building and spaces that we're creating and are accessing. So if we're thinking about the institutional accessibility, we want to ensure that an organisational system has no barriers in place, such that disabled people have equal access on every level. So what does that mean? Um, well, a system or organisation with truly no barriers is unfortunately at this stage in the game going to be an exception rather than the rule. You know, the potential for that to change comes from prioritisation of disability inclusion. And as it stands, there are degrees of institutional accessibility that can happen. And, and I know when Ashley was talking about the barriers, when institutional barriers, these are the sort of your systemic changes that need to occur and they need to occur at every level of an organisation. So if we're thinking of a school, it needs to occur at every single level. So, you know, while we're talking about um, what happens with students in classroom? Well, who impacts and who makes those decisions? Well, it's teachers, it's leadership, it's administration. You know, it's going beyond that. It's thinking about New York City DOE and centralization. It's all those different uh, components on, we need to actually impact every single level of an institution. Informational accessibility. So ensuring that information can be accessed by, accessed by all. Um, this is accomplished by preparing and offering modifications to the way information is sent and received. And that's whether it's in person or virtually. You know, as part of these webinars, we have Greeny obviously joining us here this evening, who is doing an incredible job with ASL. And um, I hope all of you got to see uh, her ASL interpretation with the music. It really does add so much more um, to not only just hearing incredible music, but visually seeing what she does for the interpretation. Um, you know, we spoke about, well, what does it look like virtually? And when we're thinking about virtual uh, pieces, a lot of the things that we use actually have accessibility built in. And so it's thinking about, well, am I just turning it on? So for example, the Microsoft suite has an accessibility function, just like you go do spell check or any of those other pieces, you can actually go accessibility and that will check different things like the font size that you're using. It will also check things like the color um, differentiation between different pieces. You know, we also know that websites, um, high contrast websites, screen readers, large and alt text is available in all images. You know, when you're posting something um, on Facebook or Instagram or all those social medias, now all that stuff is built in. We've just got to now encourage people to use it. And again, that's not adding the extra cost to any of us. It's now just going, all right, let's actually use it in our everyday. Let's change our behaviours and make sure it's a part of what we do. So attitudinal accessibility. And, and I think obviously, you know, we are probably um, preaching to the choir a little bit of everyone who is on this call and, and the webinar today. But it's ensuring the existence of accessibility by raising an awareness of prejudices and working together to break down ableist uh, stereotypes and biases and the stigmas that is associated with our society. And so as our world becomes you know, increasingly more digital, informational accessibility becomes all the more important and attitudinal pieces and all those different things that we are trying to change, you know, we need to work together to put that forward and um, 
yeah, and I think that a big part of that is obviously you've been on these webinars today, going and watching the other webinars that we've done um, and realizing that this, this one piece of the puzzle actually requires all of us to do the work. You know, it's not just one individual that will be able to change um, the attitudinal perspectives of a community. So there are wonderful uh, tools out there to teach attitudinal accessibility um, and accurate disability representation found in books and TV and film and podcasts and social media um, are things that we highly encourage. Uh, you know, Judith Human and her work, whether it be by her books or her podcasts, really does dispel a lot of the myths and the biases and the stigma and all those different things that are associated with disability and has been at the forefront of the disability rights movement. But we encourage you to think about books focusing on disability and specifically books by disabled authors or illustrators. You know, they are an incredible, powerful tool for disability representation. And one thing that we'll talk about a little bit more is, well, how do we do that within our curriculum that we offer in schools? And it's about putting forward the best literature, putting forward you know, the best evidence on all these different things, but making sure that it has accurate representation and um, appropriate stakeholder involvement. And, and that's where there's been a wonderful shift actually in the last five to 10 years um, is that disability representation is getting seen and getting the, the voices and, you know, the, the loud trajectory that it needs to make the difference. So I'll hand it over to Ashley now uh, to see to wrap it up around what we want for our students. So we've talked a lot about what we don't want for our students, but what do we want for them? We want them to feel welcome and included in all aspects of their life, at school, on the playgrounds, um, on school buses, in their neighborhoods, and in social settings, of course. To they, we want them to experience themselves being fully and completely included in the world around them and to benefit from accessibility and inclusion as they're able to see these barriers sort of break down and gradually get lesser and lesser and lesser as time goes on. And to sum it all up, you know, really the crux of the matter is we want them to feel included, welcomed, and empowered. And this is a quote from um, the truly incomparable Emily Liddell. We've introduced you to Emily in an earlier webinar, uh, but her voice here, it really rings as true as it ever does. Accessibility is too often reduced to some kind of marketing stunt or a ploy for feel good, warm, fuzzy attention. But Accessibility is none of that. Um, as Emily said, it's an active practice. It, it takes dedicated action. And it's a practice that has to exist alongside the practice of allyship as well. So what would the world look like if accessibility and inclusion weren't afterthoughts? Wouldn't that be fab? It's not hard to imagine, you know, what an incredible place the world would be if disability and inclusion were always at the forefront, not an afterthought. Necessity really is the mother of invention. And if disability were integrated into default design principles, um, if universal design were truly a given, then the disability community and the whole world really would benefit from the innovation that disability and living with a disability constantly requires. And we're gonna show you another cool little clip here and then we'll talk about it.
So y'all, I just think that's like the coolest thing ever. Um, I use a wheelchair, like, I don't know, 10 or 15, 10% of the time when I'm traveling or like, you know, want to go to Ikea or whatever. But if you're a wheelchair user, or if you've ever been literally anywhere with someone in a wheelchair or someone who uses some other sort of mobility aid, you'll know that access can look kind of dicey sometimes. Um, ramps that are not up to code, ramps that are in a back alley next to a garbage dumpster, um, a service elevator that's dingy and gross. Um, I really could go on and on. It is sometimes a harrowing experience. And what I love about this example, which is so contrary to all that, is that accessibility here is in absolutely no way an afterthought or an exclusion. The entrance is not separate. It's not around the corner, around the back. It's the front entrance, the same as the entrance that everyone else goes into with truly universal design, fully integrated into the design of the building. It's just phenomenal. And it's an example of true, like equitable accessibility, intentional, from the very get-go. So I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel. So another sort of example of this that we'll give is Sarah Hendren, um, who is an artist, designer, researcher, writer, and she's a professor at Holland College. Her um, book is What Can the Body Do? You know, one of her notable projects is working with a colleague, Amanda Kachia, who has dwarfism, and it was to create a portable carbon fiber lectern scaled to her height. So one of the biggest things that Amanda said is I'm lecturing, I'm doing all these different things, but I don't have a lectern that I can um, go up against. I would have to either stand on a chair or something behind that lectern. It's not appropriate for me. So because she is, um, you know, a speaker and a lecturer at lots of different classes, she made a, a portable lectern so that she could be up there presenting in the way that she wanted to be and, you know, having it, encapsulate that environment to focus on what she's good at and and her skill set as a lecturer and a, a teacher in colleges rather than going okay you know how can I you know go up to a, a lectern uh, that other people are using so you know I think there's so many wonderful answers to a lot of these different problems a some of them are already out there and it's just a matter of looking and saying well what's going to work for me and my students, what's going to work at our school, um, that there is incredible creative ideas uh, that have been done. And, and another one is Alice Shepard. Uh, she's a dancer and performer. And this quote by her, disability is more than a deficit of a diagnosis. It is an aesthetic, a series of intersecting cultures and a creative force. And they, um, she performs um, with uh, kinetic light dance and it's if you ever get an opportunity, they're performing here in New York City. They're also performing in Chicago, um, their new performance Wired. But one of the biggest things uh, that they do is bring the beauty and design into their performances around disability. They don't try to exclude it or hide it.
culture aesthetic recognizes that disabled dancers and disabled audience members not only participate in this art form, we shape its growth and reach. It acknowledged the presence of disability enables dance to be detected in new ways and different places. These recognitions oblige us to acknowledge that dance is not always received in a particular manner through the eyes. Sometimes the movement of an ASL interpreter communicates as much dance as the dancers who are speaking or the text of the sound call score. Dance can be touched, it can be felt. Sometimes it is audio scribed and taken in through the ear. Sometimes it's not even intended for the eye. Dance can be a soundtrack of music, wheels, feet, crutch tips, the hum of a power chair, the taps, the body's lifting, the breathing, gliding, and sweating. Sometimes it is in the movement of an audience member as they leave their seat to process and feel the experience by moving around. I experienced this latter modality recently when the dance on stage was keenly processed by movement of audience members with cognitive and sensory disabilities. So, you know, Alice really, I suppose, celebrates uh, disability in her performances, but also actually challenges all of us to think differently on how we're perceiving performance, how we're perceiving art, and, you know, what's our involvement, what's our role in the whole process. So, you know, to sum up today, I think we want to sort of look at, well, what does Just Say Hi bring to the table? And I know some of you have already sort of heard some of this, but we think disability inclusion and disability education should be taught in schools. And so this work brings the required allyship, embedding concepts into every element of the conversation, friendships and leadership within a school environment. Um, the, the piece that we think is so important is if you're trying to create a welcoming community, it is just not the students with and without disabilities that we're focusing on. It is the family, so welcome and thank you for all of you being here tonight. And it's the educators and the staff and the whole network of stakeholders um, who make up uh, a school community. And so, you know, we think targeting one component won't create the welcoming community that we're all looking for. It really is a whole group effort and making sure everybody is involved. So for any of you asking, well, how can we get these in our school? How can we, you know, have our students learn about disability, whether it be around, you know, who is the disability community, disability history and laws, breaking down stereotypes, you know, the power of language and now welcoming communities. Well, you can spread the word about Just Say Hi program around parents and guardians of students at your schools. Um, advocate for bringing the program to your school, reach out to your school council as assistant principals and engage with your PTA leaders. And honestly, being here tonight and continuing to advocate for disability inclusion um, is the best interest for the whole uh, entire school community. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, and we now welcome any questions that you might have. All right. There are a few questions in the chat, uh, but I think uh, some of them you've already addressed, but I'll, I'll go for it anyway. Um, what are some methods that can be used to counter ableism and internal ableism? Ashley, do you want to have a go at that one first? Yeah, I think that's, that's such a big answer because it's going to look so different depending on the circumstance. And I think as parents and families, what we can directly do, that's probably the easiest thing, is a lot of ableism, we've said this a million times, but that's because it's honestly the truth and it's just so important. A lot of ableism and a lot of internalized ableism comes from a lack of representation. Kids with disabilities are internalizing these negative things about themselves because in part, they're not seeing positive, accurate, maybe even neutral depictions of disability in the world around them, in the media, in their lives, in their direct like spheres of interaction. So the more exposure they can have to that, both you know through in-person interaction and through the media that they're consuming, the less likely they are going to be to internalize all of the ableist things that they hear. It's, it's you got to find the balance between the two and the representation really is the most powerful way you can counteract that. At least it in would, my experience. 
Yeah, we talked about it a little bit last week, right? Um, where we were talking about the importance of representation. Um, and it's, and I like to always take it back to like the importance of, uh, in, in reference of like mirrors, windows and sliding glass doors, right? Um, we, like, we always need to make sure that our children have access uh, to mirrors that reflect their own experiences, windows that let them to see into other people's experiences and sliding glass doors that let them cross over, right? Um, and, and so I think one of the things we talked about last week was um, that we have agency when we consume media, when we consume all of these things and, and really using that, that agency uh, thoughtfully, right? And making sure that, you know, we as um, adults in children's lives are not only consuming and providing those opportunities, but being intentional, right, about that. Um, we, we have a lot of sway in what children experience as adults, right? Um, so that's just what my thinking went to when you were talking, Ashley. And I think for, for parents around internal ableism and particularly for their child, if they're thinking, okay, internal ableism is something that my child is really experiencing, having open and honest conversations and, and allowing uh, those conversations to happen and say, it's okay that you're feeling this way and I can understand why you're feeling this way um, because of those different things, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about where the reinforcement is coming from. Let's talk about, you know, what is, whether it be in an environment at school, whether it be from friendships, whether it be from family, you know, what can we do to talk about and bring ableism to be part of the conversation? Because I think so much of the time, students with disabilities uh, think they have to be strong, think they have to show that they are achieving and that they are meeting expectations and they're doing all those different things, but internally they could be feeling a really, really different way. And so I think being able to have those conversations as families, and you know, I know I've mentioned it before, but if you're ever concerned that you think your child needs more mental health support, please get it for them because we know that that is, it's real, internal ableism exists. And sometimes, you know, it can mean that people need more support to help deal with different things that they may be feeling. I also think, and feel free either Ashley or Rachel to jump in on this. I also think that um, as adults in children's lives, we kind of need to be able to understand the difference between internalized ableism and genuine frustration. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's, in the world, I, I'm thinking about Zach's video, right? Like there was some expletive language in the video, but that was a genuine emotion that he, and frustration that he was feeling at the, at the moment. It, it took him hours to get to Brooklyn to get a rainbow bagel, right? Like, and just be, and just, I say that to say that not every moment of frustration and not every discomfort is a sign of internalized ableism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed right. wholeheartedly. Uh, anyone who would say, you know, that the experience of living as a disabled person in the world is not at times exceedingly frustrating, it's, it's just, it's just not true. And, and I think disabled children and disabled adults, you know, very often we, we're sort of forced into this trap of toxic positivity of like Rachel was talking about, you have to achieve, you have to prove yourself, you, you have to do all these things just to sort of earn your place in the world, you know, and it shouldn't be that way, but it, but it is that way. And I think as adults in children's lives, something helpful that can happen is be it internalized ableism or genuine frustration, whatever the root, if, if a child is expressing these things to you, like not to invalidate that from a perspective of toxic positivity, not to, to be, oh, don't, oh, don't feel that way or, but really just kind of hold that space and, and say, you know, like, it's okay that you feel that way. Like I get it. No wonder you do, but, but then, you know, moving into like, what can we do about it? What tools can we equip ourselves with to, to be able to navigate those feelings regardless of where they're coming from? I love that. It's like almost like a process for, for, for families to say, you know, okay, pause, listen, validate, mm -hmm. then empower, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. 
Uh, anyone can write that down and take notes for that if you want to <laughs> use it later. Uh, I know that we could talk about this for hours, and but I know we're a little over time. So I just wanted to say thank you to Ashley, Rachel, and Debbie, who, who's been here the whole time in the background supporting. Um, thank you to Cerebral Palsy Foundation to, for agreeing to partner with us to do this. Um, I, I, like I said in, my, in, in the first session, I, I worked with you all since basically my first day at the DOE, trying to get Just Say Hi launched, and it has been quite a journey. Um, and so I just, I just wanna thank you all for expanding the curriculum to include these family sessions and agreeing, because now these are gonna live permanently on our YouTube channel, families can use them. And families who might ask themselves, could this program be good for my child's school can absolutely answer the, their question by saying yes and looking at these five videos. Anything you wanna say uh, on that front before we close out? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the powerful things about this, this program is it's not meant to be an add-on or, you know, to go in and change the whole system of what's happening in a school. This is meant to be, you know, a, a real sort of parallel effort that it's like we can work within the system that's there, you know, while hopefully then some changes may happen, you know, we can really sort of build this into what's currently happening, whether it be in different curricula across all different subjects, um, whether it be that there's a specific need at a school or whatever it might, you know, that piece might be. But yeah, we really encourage and we believe strongly that one big part of changing attitudinal barriers or any of these different piece, pieces is disability education. And without that, you know, while we can have obviously structural pieces in place like IEPs and 504s, which are absolutely important and we are not taking any of those away, we definitely want people to feel like they have a sense of identity and belonging and students with disabilities deserve that and they deserve to be part of that conversation. So, you know, obviously we're very passionate about this program and would love to bring it to your um, child's school or your, or your school. Well, thanks again, everyone. And, and for all those who are tuning in, uh, please share these videos out with folks. The more, the more folks uh, know about this, the more accessible the world becomes, the more inclusive the world becomes. So thanks everyone. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Have a great night, everyone. See y'all next week. Bye.